Welcome to the world of the shockingly dangerous Latin Kings. There doesn't appear to be a week when the Latin Kings aren't making news headlines, but where did it all start? In the 1950s, when thousands of Puerto Ricans moved to Chicago for a better life, it wasn't long before the new locals began to make the Humboldt Park neighborhood the center of their community. New businesses were thriving, but soon the local Latino community began to face constant violence and threats from racist Italian, Irish, and Greek gangs in the area. So, to make a stand against the racial prejudice, a man named Raymond Sanders Santos began the Imperials, a Puerto Rican progress movement that soon merged with various other Puerto Rican and Mexican street gangs to form what's known today as the Latin Kings. Feeling a sense of power from what he created, Santos became known as King Papo and decided to structure the gang like a monarchy, with the kings at the top and foot soldiers at the bottom. Operating in gang colors of black and gold, where black represents death and gold represents life, there are three stages within the gang. Stage one starts out at the primitive stage, where a lot of grunt work and petty gang crime is done. Stage two sees the members have a choice. This is the conservative stage, and where those who feel like they've earned their stripes but want to leave the gang are granted permission. This can only happen though once they found a job and a wife. Stage three is the new king stage, where members are officially admitted, thereby devoting their whole life to the gang. When this stage is complete, if any member violates a Latin King's regulation, they receive a punishment, which can range from fines to a three or five minute beating by three or five members or even death. Central to the Latin King philosophy is the symbol of the five point crown, which represents love, respect, sacrifice, honor, and obedience. By the mid-70s, the king soon dominated the drug trafficking trade in Chicago and had turned into a huge criminal enterprise. To this day, they stretch across most of the U.S. and even to Europe. With great power, however, came great pressure, and the stress of building an empire meant many kings and key members were getting high on their own supply. This led to seven of the kings drawing up the King's Manifesto, stating rules to help guide and organize the whole gang and to maintain order. One of the biggest guidelines was the use of no drugs unless it was marijuana. Following these rules, in 1972, leader King Papo voluntarily stepped down due to his own addiction problems, with the power being handed to a young and hungry 17-year-old named Gustavo Gino Colon. At the time, Gino was serving a 27-year prison sentence for murder, but he had no problems running things from his tiny cell, and his young age didn't stop him from having ambitions to make the Latin Kings the biggest and most feared gang in the entire country. To achieve this, Gino allowed other ethnicities to join and increase street crimes such as raids, robberies, and burglaries to make even more money. All this led to the Latin Kings causing major havoc and being the gang behind some truly unbelievable stories. In 1983, Northside Latin King Carlos Robles was murdered in prison on the orders of Raul Gonzalez, aka Baby King, for feeling disrespected. Parts of Robles' body were put through the prison kitchen meat grinder and served unknowingly as meatloaf to other hungry inmates. In the late 70s, members of the Latin Kings took down an Illinois National Guard armory, stealing a number of military weapons, including an M60, M16s, and a crate of hand grenades. In 1989, they murdered Correctional Officer Lawrence Cush Jr. at the Stateville Correctional Center for being a threat to their inside drug business. Kush was said to be on a list of up to 30 officers who were being targeted by the gang, purely for refusing to not be dirty cops. In the summer of 1988, King Papo, the man who had started it all, suddenly disappeared. And to this day, no one knows what happened to him. There are rumors that he was murdered from the inside. Others said that he simply fled the country, but no body or evidence has ever been found to confirm either story. The Latin Kings are still said to be under the national leadership of Lord Gino and Baby King. With both of them still incarcerated, it demonstrates the incredible communication and organization that the gang has in and out of prison.
For five decades, a gang has intimidated their opponents enough to make their way to the top. However, during 2007, in Ecuador, an unexpected transformation happened. The newly elected president, Rafael Correa, took an unprecedented decision to legalize gangs across the country, recognizing the Latin Kings as a cultural and social organization, which soon began to work alongside the police, social services, and churches in the slums. And with new access to government grants and funding, this led to Latin King members launching new careers as social workers, entrepreneurs, and even fashion designers. Members were still very active in their gangs, but these were now functioning more like social movements or cultural groups that were supporting the communities to help set up initiatives to combat drug trafficking and to even raising funds for earthquake victims. One of the main reasons the Latin Kings have grown to be the largest Hispanic organization in Chicago and one of the largest worldwide is because of the deep sense of brotherhood. Members believe once a king, always a king. And with that strong state of mind and commitment, the Latin Kings will no doubt be a force in gang culture for years to come.